So welcome back to the first module for the second lecture. And this lecture is entitled The Climate Crisis, Facts and International Governance. So uh, today I will bring you into the world of climate change to learn about the facts uh, and the data of the state of the art on climate change, but also on the international governance and in particular um, the international negotiation processes that occur in time. Let's review the structure of this lecture. So I will first introduce the main facts and data from experts and institutions regarding climate change. Then we will review the sectors that are responsible for climate change. After that, we will see the historical steps of international negotiation process on climate change. And we will review the false solutions that has been implemented so far. As well, we will discuss um, the conference of the part on climate change that occurred in Paris in 2015. And finally, we will see what alternative solution there actually exists to tackle climate change. So let's review better what is the climate situation. Today there is no more doubt about the seriousness of the climate threat. The climate emergency is the biggest emergency that humanity is called to face and there is no more doubt in regards with its anthropic origin on which 97% of scientists agree on. Since the 80s scientists talk about the Anthropocene, first mentioned by the biologist Eugène Sturmer and adopted in 2000 by the Nobel Prize chemist Paul Crutzen to indicate the geological era in which man and its activities are the principal causes for climate, structural and territorial changes. Today, almost all scientists agree that the temperature rises causes are anthropic, that is to say caused by our activities. If no radical change is implemented, we risk to reach plus 4 degree temperature rise by 2100. Among climate change consequences, Known now for years, we can quote the movement and transfer of the climatic areas, the wave of heat, the wave of cold, the disturbance in rain levels, it less rain, less rain, more concentrated, extreme weather events, the loss of vast areas of forest and cultivated land, as well as the melting of glaciers and polar caps. We can quote also sea levels rising, a disappearance of thousands of hectares of coastal land. We, we notice biodiversity loss, desertification and drought. The Internal Displacing Monitoring Center states that 85% of environmental migrations are caused by climate change related disasters. 205 50,000 million climate refugees are expected by 2050. Following the information from the last report uh, developed by the Italian organization CESPI, FOXIV and WWF Italy, there have been already 157 million climate refugees between 2008 and 2014. So let's see what the EPCC says. The EPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of the UN. It assesses the scientific, technical and socio-economic information relevant for the understanding of the risk of human-induced climate change. The EPCC was set up in 1988 by the World Meteorological Organization and the United Environmental Programme to provide policymakers with regular assessments of the scientific basis of climate change, its impacts and future risks, and options for adaptation and mitigation. So what does the report say? Uh, it says that in 2014 the temperature in the low atmosphere had risen of plus zero uh, dot 85 degrees since the end of the 19th century and that the ocean's level had risen 19 centimeter. What are the EPCC indication? They said that there is no magic and we need for a radical change that the emission should be reduced of 70 percent by 2050 and totally stop by 2100 to avoid the catastrophe and all future human life on Earth. 
Uh, they also said that we only have 15 years to revert the trend or it will be too late. And what does the UN World Meteorological Organization say about CO2 concentration? They said the level of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere had reached a peak in 2013, being the higher of 142% in comparison with, nine, with, eight, with 1750 before the Industrial Revolution. The level of carbon anhydride ppm parties per million have reached 396, while the security level is 350 ppm. Between 2012 and 2013, the CO2 concentration has increased of 2.9 ppm, the major increase register in the 1984-2013 period. The double MO forces that at this pace, CO2 concentration will exceed 400 ppm by 2016. The American National Oceanic and Atmosphere Administration declared June 2016 as the hottest ever register on the planet since the beginning of the temperature registration in 1880. The temperature for the period January-June 2016 is 0.2 degree higher than the last year record and over plus 1.05 degree compared to the last century average. Let's see what the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate says about climate change. Um, the Commission is composed of former heads of governments and finance ministers of leaders in the field of economics and business. It is presided by Nicolas Stern, which is a World Bank leader and author of the well-known Stern Report, which is 2006, calculated the economic impacts of climate change and warned back then that if we were not able to face the climate challenges, the global economy would risk to lose 20% of its GDP. The Commission 2015 report, which is far from being written by climate justice activists, but by capitalist-related experts, underlines that to implement an efficient action, it would be needed to stop fossil fuel subsidies. We're talking about 600 billion dollars every year versus 100 billion US dollars directed at renewable energy. Um, to develop only low carbon infrastructure corresponding to 90,000 billion US dollar investment in the next 15 years, this would mean to spend 250 billion USD more every year, which though would be compensated by the minor depends on fossil resources and less public health expenses, because 50 major CO2 polluted countries does spend 4% of their GDP in health costs related to atmospheric contamination. It is clear that there is no kind of slowing down in the global warming phenomenon, and its effects are already irreversible. Only a concrete and immediate action could contain damage and reinforce Earth resilience capacity. So welcome back to the first module for the second lecture and this lecture is entitled The Climate Crisis, Facts and International Governance. So uh, today I will bring you into the world of climate change to learn about the facts uh, and the data of the state of the art on climate change but also on the international governance and in particular um, the international negotiation processes that occur in time. So let's see what are the sectors that are responsible for so much greenhouse gases emission. Um, let's say that there's three main polluting sectors, the energy sector, the agriculture sector and the forestry industrial sectors. But also it's important uh, to quote other um, participating emitters sector such as the production of industrial production of goods, the cement industry, the transport, the urban development, waste. So let's look at the countries uh, emitting CO2. I look at two perspectives. Uh, the global amount uh, of CO2 emitted but also the amount of CO2 emitted pro capita. So let's first see review the global amount in terms of metric ton of carbon in the world. Uh, the leader in terms of producing CO2 is China, followed by the United States of America, India, Russia, Japan, Germany, 
the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Republic of Korea, Saudi Arabia, and finally Brazil. So we just saw the total amount that country produces in terms of CO2 emission and the main countries that are polluting. It's interesting though to see um, the range of country by the emission pro capita. That means how much one person emits in a definite country. If you look this way, you will see that the first countries uh, emitting pro capita are quite different than the, the countries that are more polluting because probably they have more people. If we look and so divided the CO2 emission by the number of people living in a definite country, we will see that the first country uh, of emission pro capita is Qatar with uh, about 11.03 um, metric ton of CO2 pro capita. It is followed by Trinidad and Tobago with 9.41 metric ton CO2 metric ton pro capita, followed by Curaçao, then Kuwait, then Bahrain, then San Martin, it's a the Dutch portion of St. Martin, uh, followed by the Falkland Islands, uh, then followed by Brunei, Brunei, sorry, and then followed by the United Arab Emirates and then Luxembourg. So as you see, those are uh, mainly small countries, sometimes small islands or countries from the Arabic Peninsula, uh, apart from Luxembourg, which, which is the only European country um, in the in the picture. It is interesting also because obviously the more people you have the more you emit it but it's also interesting to look which country actually has a lot of emission but a very low number of inhabitant. So we have seen in the first part of this lecture um, the main facts and data regarding climate change we will now focus more uh, on the governance and policies regarding climate change. So first of all, uh, we need to clarify two important concept concepts regarding climate change actions. Um, they are called mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation are the interventions to reduce on one hand the sources of emission and the emissions themselves, and to increase, in the other hand, the absorption of greenhouse gases. Adaptation regards the initiatives and measures to reduce the vulnerability of natural systems and humans against occurring or planned climate change effects. So let's say that mitigation actually wants to act at the root of the issue while adaptation is going to answer to the um, effects of climate change. So let's say that uh, Regarding the actual governance of climate change, we can say that there is a real lack of concrete mitigation measure because we still do not succeed to reduce drastically our emission, while adaptation measures are the most uh, developed policy sector. So let's see now a um, clear picture with the important step of the climate negotiation international process. So first of all, uh, in 1988, the EPCC, we saw before it is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, was established by the UN. Four years after that, in 1992, uh, the Rio Earth Summit identified three emergency, climate change, desertification and biodiversity loss. In result of the Rio, the, the Rio Summit, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UFCCC, is signed. This convention established national greenhouse gas emissions inventories and from 1999 and on, it supports the, year, the yearly conferences of the parties, what we call the COP, to assess the progress in dealing with climate change among UN members. Followed by uh, this, in 1997, the Kyoto Protocol is signed. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol is the first well-known climate change protocol. It is setting internationally binding emission reduction targets and it entered into force in 2000, 
and fine. So we can already notice how when a protocol regarding climate change is signed, it entered into force so many years after that, giving time for the country to assess in order to implement the protocol. Um, after that, there has been many COP, of course, but let's say that the most important COP after the Kyoto Protocol occurred in 2009 in Copenhagen. Um, there was many expectation regarding uh, this COP um, in regards to setting new agreements among uh, the part. Unfortunately, it has been a failure. A failure. And the following uh, COP did not really manage to address this issue until Paris. But let's stop to 2010 uh, to, mention, to mention the People's Summit on Climate change that has been hosted by the Bolivian government in Cochabamba, Bolivia. Uh, it was an interesting uh, summit because it was not the usual UN meeting, it was not at all a UN meeting, it was convocated by uh, a radical government inviting all social movement all around the world to join in order to draw uh, a declaration stating what were the measures that the people were actually looking forward that the government would assume. Uh, the year after that, in 2011, during the COP in Durban, the Durban Agreement was signed and it was establishing a sort of pre-agreement, the Paris Agreement. Then, last year, in 2015, as you have of course heard a lot about, uh, the Paris Agreement was signed. Um, this is the new global agreement on climate change. So who are the actors of such UN negotiation processes? So they are mainly uh, heads of states and their negotiators. Uh, but also companies are involved as well as civil society that are represented by a few organizations that are invited for consultation, but they have no deliberative or other kind of power. So why, if we are negotiating since more than 20 years, things are still the same? And what decision and measure do they take that are inappropriate? So welcome back to the first module for the second lecture. And this lecture is entitled The Climate Crisis, Facts and International Governance. So uh, today I will bring you into the world of climate change to learn about the facts uh, and the data of the state of the art on climate change, but also on the international governance and in particular um, the international negotiation processes that occur in time. So those inappropriate measures are what we call the false solutions. The first of the false solutions uh, among them all is the carbon market. Um, it emerged in 2010 at the Cancun COP and it has been confirmed in Rio in 2012 during the Rio Plus 20 summit that public-private partnership and financial markets mechanism, also called cap and trade, like carbon credit, are today at the center of emission reduction policies. In Europe, we have EPS, which means European Trading System, which was a pilot experiment in carbon credit at global level. So what are the limits of such mechanism? It is actually supporting the implementation of a market for the exchange of carbon bonds. So who has more money and pollute more can buy bonds counting for CO2 emission reduction from those countries who emit less. And this actually answer to financial market logic rather than to emission reduction objectives. And that does not allow a realistic diminution of emission. During the Genova meeting in preparation to the Paris COP, all the countries, part of the Annex 1 of the UNFCC, that are the countries that are um, major CO2 emitters, were recognized as having respected their diminution target, while in 2013, while 2013 has been recognized as the year with more CO2 emission ever. So how does countries that are the more emitting could 
uh, appears as having respecting their diminution targets if the level of emission have not been reduced. This is because of the carbon market. Let's see another false solution, the red plus mechanism. This mechanism is supposedly meant to protect forest areas as they capture part of the CO2 emitted worldwide. This mechanism, though, presents many critical points. It is, for example, property rights of a forest and other environmental services forests pr produce. It offers to polluters an easy way to compensate for emissions without changing their practices by planting trees, whatever be the type of plantation, acting as incentive to the development of intensive tree plantation for productive purposes, such as palm oil. And finally, it also violates rural and indigenous communities' rights as it considers monocultures as a reforestation strategy. But if you cut the trees, is this a real forest? Similar to the Red Plus mechanism, there is the Blue Carbon Initiative, which focuses on the carbon capture by the coastal marine ecosystem, such as the mangrove, and this system shows the same limits as the Red Plus mechanism. A third false solution worth to be mentioned is called the Climate Smart Agriculture. Defined by the FAO, which is the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, as a mechanism to guide actions needed to transform and reorient agricultural systems to effectively support development and ensure food security in a changing climate, the Climate Smart Agriculture consists mainly in intensive agriculture GMOs, patented seeds, agrotoxic, fossil fuel dependent agricultural system, and so on and so forth. For Via Campesina, which is one of the main social actors in the field of agriculture, this initiative violates food sovereignty and denies the role of farmers' agriculture in environmental protection. It's also more likely that such initiative will rather produce a major concentration of agricultural land and create dependence of farmers towards seeds modified to resist to climate change than concretely provide those most vulnerable, that is, small farmers, with means to tackle climate change. Another false solution regarding energy is called Sustainable Energy for All. Launched in 2011, this program forces to improve the access to energy and double the level of energy efficiency and renewable energy at global level by 2030. It would sound like a great initiative if it was not for the structure of its board's director. As denounced by the Global Forest Coalition, the board is composed of members coming from the main energy, industrial and financial multinationals, as well as of investors from the fossil fuel sector, while only five members are from governments and three from NGOs. Among the advisory board members, we can quote CEOs from the Royal Dutch Shell, Masdar, State Oil, Bloomberg New Energy Finance and Akshona. How could the people that are actually responsible for the current crisis be part of the solution? This is a question that has still no answer, at least for them. So welcome back to the first module for the second lecture. And this lecture is entitled The Climate Crisis, Facts and International Governance. So uh, today I will bring you into the world of climate change to learn about the facts uh, and the data of the state of the art on climate change, but also on the international governance and in particular um, the international negotiation processes that occur in time. A full solution regarding biodiversity is the Business and Biodiversity Offsets Programme, the BBOP. Composed of 75 companies, financial institutions, governmental agencies and NGO representatives, the programme aims to develop a compensation system for biodiversity loss. The main critics to such programme lies in the fact that it is that it further monetized natural resources and legitimate the practice for which environmental degradation in a given area can be compensated for the creation anywhere in the world of a similar ecosystem. This is one of the limits of 
the concrete measure that are taken today. You cannot think to replace biodiversity in one place by putting it in another place. You need to protect and ensure that biodiversity is conserved everywhere, all over the world. There are many more other false solutions. Um, to quote only a few, we're gonna review uh, some few more that are often influenced by the programs and initiatives that we just reviewed before. So we can quote, for example, large-scale biofuels production, uh, which actually increase large-scale intensive energy monoculture, extending the exploitation frontier to new lands and increasing biodiversity loss and soil erosion. Biofuels are sell as um, an alternative to fossil fuel energy, but they actually implies a lot of uh, complex problem and issues and actually produce themselves lots of problems which are not tackling at all climate change. We can also uh, quote geoengineering that foresees in particular two types of interventions. On one side, carbon dioxide removal, that is to say removing CO2 from the atmosphere to capture it somewhere else, and solar radiation management that aims to offset greenhouse gases by limiting Earth absorption of solar radiation. So said like this, it sounds a bit technical, technical. Uh, it's called geoengineering, but these technologies are still in development and most experts does not value them much, in part because they imply many uncertainties in regard with their effectiveness and possible negative impacts. So let's say that today this also seems like a, a pretty non-viable solution for the future because they still do not tackle the root of the issue. And as far as I am concerned, uh, until mm, international measures or a solution regarding climate change does not tackle the root of the issue, we still are going in the wrong direction. And among those wrong direction, uh, we can talk also about fracking. Fracking is a technique for hydrocarbon uh, resource extraction through hydraulic fracture uh, that allows the access to small reserves of oil and gas. So it actually uses um, the pressure of water to fracture rocks to get to small reserves of gas. So not only gas is a fossil fuel and oil is a fossil energy, uh, but this technology is highly contaminating and it's very difficult to um, control it and control its impacts in terms of uh, contaminating uh, components that comes from the fracture, but also in terms of the risk it has for earthquake. Um, and this is also why it is banned in most European countries. And we can also quote nuclear energy, and I don't need to say a word regarding nuclear energy, but unfortunately, because you all know, I guess, it's a long history now, we know the limits of nuclear energy, it's still uh, proposed as a clean energy, but it is one of the most dangerous energy source ever. Um, so, in conclusion, regarding this false uh, solution, uh, I would say that uh, while the first step to take to reduce emission has still never been on the negotiation table, even international financial institutions refer to the need to eliminate progressively the subventions to fossil energy and establish a global carbon tax. So why are we still talking about those false solutions and those are on the table of negotiation and on the list of on the to-do list of the governments while the first measure to be taken is still not looked like. And we have to hear that from international financial institutions really I could not conclude a lecture on climate change without talking about last COP in Paris and give a critical reading of it. As you must all know by now, in Paris, in last December 2015, a global agreement on climate change has been ratified. But if the agreement is defined by many states and big companies and sometimes big NGOs as a big success in a binding agreement, 
Many activists and scientists reply that it does not provide sanction mechanism and the objective it sets appear still inefficient, insufficient. It won't be enough to cure our planet fever. It does set the ambition to stabilize the temperature rise between 1.5 degrees and up to plus 2 degrees. But it lacks efficient measure to not go further such limit. The agreement is supposed to be implemented only in 2020 and the core of the temperature rise stabilization and emission reduction strategies lies in the ENDC, the specific objectives of each single signing country, even if everyone respects its objective, which is not given for granted, as there are no concrete tools for control and sanction, the temperature rise would reach plus 3 degrees, and after 2023, the agreement would be revised every five years. Moreover, experts from institutes like the Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research in the UK, the Center for International Climate and Environmental Research in Sweden, and the Potsdam Institute in Germany, call for more challenging targets and measures. No specific year for emission peak has been settled, and a diminution of minimum 70% of emissions on the basis of the emission level of 2010 would be needed, and action should start now, not in 2020. So welcome back to the first module for the second lecture. And this lecture is entitled The Climate Crisis, Facts and International Governance. So uh, today I will bring you into the world of climate change to learn about the facts uh, and the data of the state of the art on climate change, but also on the international governance and in particular um, the international negotiation processes that occur in time. Again, the issue lies in a lack of political will from decision makers to act drastically at the root of the issue. We need a progressive renouncement of fossil resources and their subsidies. We need a just transition of production and consumption models. But China, which citizens suffocate with smoke peak with concentration of particular matter 30 times over the WHO limits, announced that it will reduce its emission only from 2030 and on. India has no intention to renounce the coal industry, and Italy, while sharing an idealistic reduction target to reach a maximum of plus 1.5 degree, still supports the development of the fossil fuel industry, we are talking about all gas and coal, as a basis of its strategy to tackle the country's economical crisis. So looking at the facts, rather than the speeches, it appears clearly that climate change is not the priority they all talk about. In 31 pages of the agreement's text, there is no quote of the words oil or coal or fossil fuels, not one single reference to the necessity to cut the five 1300 billion dollars of subsidies to fossil fuel sea transportation and civil aviation, which represent 10% of global emission, are not part of the agreement. The loss and damage mechanism to support most vulnerable population does not have a defined system of compensation. The confirmation of the Red Plus mechanism, which recognizes tree plantation for productive purposes, recognizes it as a sustainable reforestation strategy to fight climate change. It jeopardized the objective of developing sustainable reforestation by 2020 and the financial mechanism to sustain the agreement, aiming to gather 100 billion by 2020, is still based on voluntary donation basis. In 2010, only 10% of the emission targeted has been gathered. So the boat is sinking, but the captain celebrates, while the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, announces that the number of climate refugees will reach to 150 million people by 2050, and the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, reiterates that climate change is among the biggest threat to financial market stability, our heads of state made a toast. While two 20,000 climate justice activists marches in the Paris street 
to change the system, not the climate. Our head of state still does not move their ass from their comfortable chairs. Another, let's say, fun element to read between the lines of the negotiation process in Paris. It's interesting to look who were the sponsor of this cup. As others before them, of course. Uh, last year, we had as sponsor Renault, Nissan, Ikea, BNP Paribas, Michelin, Air France, EDF, which is the electric company, Galerie Lafayette, Carrefour, L'Oréal, Sanofi, Google, French Banks Association, and so on and so forth. And among them, we can see one of the main contaminating sectors that are the roots of the greenhouse gas emissions. So that's really fun. They are all investing so much on a negotiation process that are actually leave them doing their business as usual. So, we have seen so far the main facts at stake regarding climate change, the international institutional negotiation process and its measures. We have analyzed the last climate agreement signed in Paris. Now, let's see what are the main alternative proposals from the social movements against for climate justice to tackle climate change. Of course, they have more to do with mitigation and they start with main and first steps that should have been taken already a long time ago to reduce and finally stop fossil resources extraction, leaving 80% of the known oil reserve under the ground and put an end to fossil fuel sector subsidies. Social movement also asked to fix reduction targets in absolute terms and not in percentage, as for example, 45 global ton by 2020, 40 GT by 2025, 35 GT by 2030, and guaranteeing that reductions are measured without accounting reduction evaluated from the financial mechanisms. They also ask to actuate a real energy transition based on a decentralized renewable energy model with major control and rights for local administration and communities. They also has to actuate a real transition of the economic model toward a more socially and environmentally sustainable society respecting the limits of our planet in terms of local production and consumption, small agriculture and energy production system, sustainable conversion of productive systems, limit transportations, and adopt real zero waste strategies, so on and so forth. They has to improve and extend public transport and dismantle war industry to reduce emissions related to war markets and redistribute, redistribute war budget to climate change action. I hope you enjoyed uh, and you learned from this uh, lecture. We will see us very soon for our third lecture, an introduction to socially and environmentally sustainable conversion. So now that you have a little bit more of understanding of what is going on in the world, we will be able to go and start looking at what sustainable conversion is. See you soon. Bye bye.